1 Thessalonians 5, verses 14 through 23. We stand this afternoon in honor of the reading of God's Word and the King James text. Let me put it up on the screen. There you go. In case you do not have a Bible, the King James text today reads, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, today once again, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come into the house of God. Lord, we realize today this is no great cathedral. This is not a marvelous temple. It is not an edifice that in and of itself brings great glory to your name. But Lord, it is not the brick, it is not the stone, it is not the walls, nor the carpeting, nor the seating that brings you glory, but it is the souls that come into this place in your name with every intention of magnifying the name of Jesus. Your church today, God, is not made up of stone and brick and wood. It is made up of men and women, boys and girls, who have embraced this wonderful gospel truth and allowed you to perform a miraculous work in their life. Master, in the name of Jesus, anoint the word of the Lord at this hour. Help me, God, to do justice by that message which you've laid on my heart for the people of God. At this moment in time, let the hearer have a heart that is cultivated and ready to receive a word from the Lord. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated this afternoon. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You might notice today that this message doesn't really fall into a Christmas theme. Uh, this preacher does not preach by the season nor the holiday. I preach what God gives me to preach. And next week, he's given me a Christmas-themed message. Now, there are a lot of times, of course, he gives me messages that work in conjunction with the holiday. But this day, God has laid a message on my heart that is a little bit different in its theme, but I believe it is important to every believer. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 through 23, the Apostle Paul exhorts the church at Thessalonica. In the course of his various admonishments, he tells the saints, among many other things, to pray without ceasing. My goodness. Well, Lord, Paul, i got to eat. i got to go to work. I've got things to do. I can't pray without ceasing. How in the world are we supposed to put that into practice? I would tell you today that prayer is a lifestyle. It is not just a religious exercise. You see, a lot of people have it all wrong and they wind up losing out in their walk with God 
because they believe that prayer is all about getting down on your hands and knees. It's all about folding. You remember when we were kids, you're supposed to fold your hands in front of your face, you know. Now, I'm not saying that that kind of prayer doesn't have its place. It most definitely does. But what I'm telling you today is prayer is a lifestyle. Prayer simply means an open line of communication with God. That's all it means. Believers today, if you're full of the Holy Ghost, if you're walking in the Spirit, then you should be able to walk in a constant, ever open line of communication with God. In other words, you should never hang up that phone. Amen. You Now, most of y'all are old enough, I, I dare say. Now, the ladies on the back are going to get mad at me for saying that. But most of us are old enough to remember the time when you'd get on the phone with somebody. And of course, it was hardwired into the house, you know. And you'd get on the phone with somebody, and you'd say, Well, all right then, I'll talk to you later. Bye. And you'd hang up. And then a couple hours later, you'd go pick up the phone, and... You'd hear something going on the other end and you're still hearing your mother chatting at your dad or you're still hearing your dad yelling at your mother. Somebody forgot to hang up their receiver right if I tell them the truth. You remember what I'm talking about? Oh, if both parties, those of you watching on YouTube and Facebook, a lot of you were too young to remember, uh, but if both parties didn't hang up their line correctly, then that line remained open. Well, I've got news for you, honey. God don't never hang up on you. Hello now. Did you hear me today? God don't never hang up on you. That's why when you pick up the line, he's automatically there. Hallelujah. You don't even have to dial his number. He said, when you call on my name, I'm there to answer. Hallelujah. So all you got to do is pick up the phone. Only problem is you should have never put it down to begin with. Hello now. You just should have never put that phone down to begin with. Paul said, amongst other things, that as children of God, we ought to pray without ceasing. What does that mean, Paul? It means to live a lifestyle of prayer. I've learned that as I go through life, Lisa, I've taught myself, and, and I've been this way now for I don't know how many years. If Tommy and I are driving down the road, and we see an accident on the side of the road, or we see fire trucks, you know, immediately I begin to pray. Oh, Lord, help those people. Whoever was in that accident, God, don't let anybody die. If they don't know you, don't let them go into eternity lost. Jesus, if, if they're able to be healed, heal them. If they're able to be helped, help them. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. And I immediately begin to pray. I was driving Uber and Lyft, and I went down one day. I was going down, uh, I believe it was 45 south in that direction, going quite a ways to pick somebody up. And I saw an accident on the side of the road, and I saw this man, you know, leaning up against the front of his steering wheel and his arm hanging out of the pickup truck. And it wasn't too hard to pretty much know that he had passed. He'd gotten crushed between two tractor trailer trucks. Can you imagine? Two tractor trailer trucks. Apparently one of them was in a steady lane and the other one was trying to move over and didn't see this fellow in between them and literally crushed this truck right between the two of them. And both tractor trailer trucks went off the road and this truck was off on the side of the road and the man was there. And immediately I began to pray for his family. Immediately, I begin to pray, oh God, help that man's family, Jesus. Lord, if that man doesn't know you, you're able to raise the dead. If he's not ready for heaven, then Lord, breathe life back into his body. I don't know about you, but my Bible said God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. I believe it's the will of God that everybody know him. That doesn't mean that God's going to get his way because people are stubborn and we got a lot of folk that are just insisting they're not going to believe in God and they're not going to believe the gospel. But God wants everybody to be saved. So if you pray for somebody's salvation, I got news for you. You're never praying outside of the will of God. 
You're never praying outside of God's will when you're praying for somebody to be saved. And I began to pray for his family. I said, oh, dear Jesus, some hard times are coming. These people are going to be crushed. Their spirits are going to be crushed. They're going to be grieving. Oh, God, be comfort to them. Be help to them. Lord, give them wisdom at this time. Help them to make the difficult decisions that are going to have to be made. And Lisa, I just start praying automatically when I see something. I'm going to tell you something. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe prayer works. I believe faith works. I believe God's listening. I believe God answers prayer. And you know what? I appreciate when people let me know they're praying for me. Amen? I appreciate when people... I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and when I was a kid, my mother's side of the family were all Pentecostal. And when I was a kid, I don't care what come your way. I don't care if you lost a job, or if you got bad news from the doctor, or you had to go to court over something. Immediately, we'd pick up that phone, and we'd start calling family, and we'd say, pray for me. Be in prayer for me. I need to tell you, if we didn't hear at least one phone call a day, somebody asking for prayer, then it was a slow day. Because prayer was a lifestyle for us. There was nothing that came our way, nothing that could possibly happen, but that our immediate first thought and our first response was pray and seek others to pray. You hear what I'm telling you now? Where two or three agree, Jesus promised, as touching any one thing, it shall be done unto them of your Father which is in heaven. Isn't that what he said? I need to get some other people touching on this. I need to get some other people feeling up on this need. Oh, the doctor just told me I've got cancer. I need to get somebody praying. See, the young believer, and the first thing they do is they start calling the specialist. They start looking for the hospital that might hold the answer. Oh, honey, I don't need a hospital that holds the answer. I've got a God that holds the answer. I know from where my help comes. My help coming from the Lord. Hallelujah. So immediately, when something comes my way, my first response, my immediate response, is to go to the Lord in prayer. People on Facebook should be grateful that this old chubby preacher is on Facebook looking at his timeline. Because as I go down that timeline, Bill... I see people talking about being sick. I see people talking about losing loved ones. I see people talking about having struggles. And immediately, I begin to pray for them. Immediately. See, prayer is not a religious exercise. Prayer is a lifestyle. Paul said, pray without ceasing. I can't stop praying because I know everywhere I look, something needs prayer. Everywhere I look, somebody needs prayer. Woo, I got to tell you, I watch MSNBC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't watch Fox, thank you very much. <laughs> the Bible tells me it's the little fox that spoils the vine. <laughs> well, I know one fox that spoils plenty, but anyway, we're not going there. I'm watching my MSNBC, and I see that old orange monster appear on the screen, you know, the one that's trying to destroy our nation and reduce us to a banana republic and who's trying to change everything into some sort of a, a dictatorship, you know, instead of a democratic republic. And I hear that voice that just grates me. And you know what my response is? Oh, I could cuss the TV. I'll admit that happens once in a while. But I start to pray, God, we need your help. Jesus, our nation needs your help. Lord, we need you to intervene on behalf of our nation. Do you understand what I'm telling you now? I watch yeah. the news, and I see somebody's house burned down. I don't know those people. They don't know me, but that's okay. I can help them. I start to pray. Right. Oh, God, help that family. Jesus, make a way for them. You see, when you're a person of faith and you walk in the Spirit, prayer is a lifestyle. Your phone is always off the hook. 
you don't dare hang it up because there are times you're driving down the road and you may not be able to pick that prayer line up. Hello now. You just got to be able to talk to the Lord and have it. Lord, you don't mind if I leave this thing off the hook laying on the seat next to me, do you? That way if I need to talk to you, I can just start talking. Hallelujah. Prayer is a lifestyle. Oh, I wish I could get God's people to live like this. I wish I could get all believers to walk like this. Dear God, have mercy. You know, people in church, I remember growing up as a kid, the pastor would talk about how, you know, people will say, oh, pray for me because thus and so. And other saints in the church are always so sweet. And they'll answer, I sure will. And then they go out the door and they done forgot all about it. They said they'd pray for you. They said they'd hold you up. But before they got out the door of the church, they done forgot all about you. And all they had on their mind was Howard Johnson's and some fried clams. <laughs> You can tell I'm from up north, can't you? <laughs> My Lord have mercy. So you know what I learned to do? I learned when Sister Johnson says, pray for me, I'm going for a job interview tomorrow. I say, I sure will. And as I turn and I start to walk to my seat in the sanctuary, or I start to head for the door, I'm automatically talking to the Lord. Sister Johnson, meet your help. Jesus, help her, Lord. Open the right doors. Close the wrong doors. Make a way for her where there seems to be no way. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I start praying right then, Martin. I don't wait. No. And you know what's funny? If I start praying right then, without fail, as time goes by, throughout the week and throughout the days, every once in a while, I'll remember, Sister Johnson. I'll remember that need. And I'll find myself praying again. But see, if I didn't pray the first time, I'd forget about it forever. But because I went to the Lord about it right then and there, I have a habit of kind of recollecting and recalling and remembering. So I'm able to pray over and over again. I'm on Facebook and somebody needs prayer. They've lost a loved one and I start praying for them. I put a little, I've created these little memes. I'm a creative person. I, I like to create stuff. I've always been this way. I've created all these little memes. I call them memes. People say, now it's memes. I've got a brother in Florida who about bites my head off every time I say meme. But <laughs> it's a meme. Okay, whatever you say. So I've created these little memes. <laughs> I've created some that are for sympathy. I've created some for birthdays. I've, cre I've created some for sympathy for pets. You know why? Because I love my babies. Anybody who knows me knows. Tommy and I love our babies. At least I do. But anyway, um, <clears throat> I wasn't allowed. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make you all my psychiatrist for a minute. My father was an animal hater. That gives you an idea what kind of man my father was. He hated animals. And he would never allow his kids to have animals. I love animals. I love animals. I love every one of them. I love all kinds of them, except snakes and spiders. Everything else I'm pretty good with. I saw a snake one time run over by a car on a, on a TV show, you know, and the poor thing was all tore up, and he was trying to crawl along. I even felt sorry for that stupid snake. And I don't like snakes. But I love animals, and I love my babies. I, I hate to call them pets because that kind of reduces them, you know. It, it makes them less than part of the family. So I just call them my babies. So when somebody on Facebook says they lost a baby, they lost a pet, I know what that feels like. And anybody who loves your babies knows that that hurts. That can really hurt. Man, when we had to put tea down, oh my Lord have mercy. I thought I was going to drop dead in the middle of the the, you know, uh, vet place there. My heart broke, and I started wailing and wailing and wailing into her little towel that we carried her there in, and I could barely stop the tears because I love my babies. So when somebody on Facebook loses one of theirs, I start praying. Lord, comfort them, help them. I know how hard that is. I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. God's concerned about anything that concerns you. I lost a goldfish one time and cried over it. 
He was big. <laughs> he was one of them big old boogers, you know. And, and he'd been in my house for years. I mean, he felt like part of the family. And when he went belly up, I went into tears. I know y'all thinking, I'm going to find me another church. This preacher's cracked. And he's crying over a goldfish. Preacher, put him in the toilet bowl and flush and call it a day. I'm sorry. I love my babies. Anything that concerns us concerns God. Anything that breaks your heart breaks God's heart. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? There is nothing in the world. Don't you ever feel embarrassed to go to God about anything. Don't you ever feel embarrassed to go to the Lord about anything? There are people who say, well, I couldn't pray about that because, well, that'd just be stupid. Why in the world would I? No, 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 no. You could go to your granddaddy with about anything in the world, and your granddaddy say, oh, Lisa, I'm sorry, honey. He was going to care about what you cared about, right? I got news for you. Jesus said, if our earthly fathers know how to give us good gifts, how much more, how much more? If our earthly fathers know how to care about what we care about, how much more does our heavenly father care about what we care about? Whew. Pray without ceasing. Oh, Christian today, if only we could get into a mindset of Prayer, if only we could adopt a lifestyle of prayer, how different our world would be when we see that homeless woman on the corner of the highway begging money. She weighs all of 80 pounds. Her face is all broken out. She's lost all kinds of teeth. It's more than obvious to anyone who knows anything about anything that she's an addict. And how many of us come out with something snarky? How many of us have a word of criticism? How many of us have a word? Well, bless God, if you get off that junk, you could get a job and you wouldn't have to be standing here begging money. Got news for you. You could serve that woman a whole lot better if you prayed for her instead of criticizing her. Mm -hmm. You could help her a whole lot better if you'd whisper a prayer, Oh, Jesus, help her, Lord. God, help her, Lord. Help that person, Lord. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? See, that's living a lifestyle of prayer. That's praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing is responding to everything, everywhere, every time in the most positive, constructive way you can respond. And the most positive, constructive way you can respond to anything is prayer. You know, I love when people online make uh, critical comments about uh, shootings, and I understand the I understand what they're saying. Don't misunderstand me. You know, the problem with too many people is well, all we want to understand is one side of the argument. That's pitiful. It's it's sad. I understand when there's a school shooting and somebody puts on Facebook, "I'll oh, keep your prayers and thoughts." Nobody needs your prayers and thoughts. What we need is gun control. Well, I understand your argument. I understand why you're saying what you're saying. But by the same token, I got news for you. Those prayers go a long way. Yes. The shooting's Amen. already happened. Kids are already dead. People are already headed to the funeral home, Martin, to make arrangements for funerals. I got news for you. Those prayers help. Amen. Praying for those families, praying for those parents, praying for those loved ones, praying for those spouses who've lost their other half. Uh, that goes a long way. Don't belittle. Don't, don't act like there's no value in that. There is. Now, do I understand what they're saying? Yes, I do. I certainly do. But by the same token, as a child of God, I understand that when somebody says, I'm praying for you, whoo, that's about the best words I could ever hear. I grew up in Pentecost. I've been in this thing a long time. You know who the prayer warriors are in the church. 
You know who those little old ladies are in the church who, well, they're retired, they don't work, so they spend hours a day on their knees praying for the church and praying for the pastor and praying for others and praying for the people on our prayer boards. Hello now. And you know who those people are. And I'm going to tell you something. When Sister Dowell says, I'm praying for you, honey, you're being prayed for. When that little sister Alexander says, I've been praying for you, guess what? <laughs> you can take that to the bank. She don't say that, Martin, just to be talking. When Sister Alexander says, I've been praying for you, you better believe that she's clocked some time before the throne of grace seeking help and aid and assistance on your behalf. I love to hear the words. I've been praying for you. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, there is no, nothing better you can say to a mother that has unsaved children than I've been praying for your kid. I've been praying for your daughter. I've been praying for your son. There is nothing you can tell a parent with a sick child that is better than I'm praying for your child. There is nothing you can tell somebody who's going through trouble in their marriage and in their relationship, then I've been praying for you all. Hello now, am I telling the truth? Anybody else in this room like to hear those words when you're in trouble? Amen. Hallelujah. You see, when you believe this thing, when you believe God's real, when you believe faith works, when you believe God answers prayer, then when somebody says, I'm praying for you, whoo, that's like money in the bank. That is like money in the bank. I love to hear people say, I'm praying for you. Got news for you when I tell you I'm praying for you. All my little Mimi's. <laughs> of course, I think Mimi, I'm thinking of that over made up woman on the Drew Carey show. You know, I'd rather call it Mimi's because at least I don't think about Mimi, you know. But I'm going to tell you all my little memes. There's a scripture on the bottom of that meme that talks about faith in God and I'm praying for you. And I don't post that picture unless I'm praying for you. I'm not just going to post that and tell you I'm praying for you and then walk off and forget all about it. No, 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 no. I start praying. I'm in bed and my other half is sleeping, which is rather often. And over the snore... God hears my voice. I'm going to take a minute to embarrass me. Of course, for God to hear me, i got to yell kind of loud. Lord, if you can hear me. But if he wakes up during the night, many, many times he's going to catch me in the middle of a sentence, talking to King Jesus on somebody's behalf. Got news for you. To talk to the Lord, you don't always have to have your mouth moving either. The Bible says on his word, I meditate both day and night. You can just talk to the Lord in your mind. You can talk to the Lord with your thoughts. The Word of God says God knows what we have need of before we even ask Him. Well, I got news for you. If you're in a position where, you know, being in prayer is going to kind of make you look crazy, you're sitting on an airplane somewhere, or, you know, or whatever the case might be, and you don't want somebody coming with a straitjacket to carry you off, then all you got to do is close your eyes. All right, Lord, let's have us a private one-on-one -on -one discussion. Let's just talk, Jesus. Lord. Of course, you might look a little crazy if you do that. I don't know. Prayer ought to be a lifestyle for believers. Prayer ought to be an immediate reaction and a, an immediate response to every need that comes across our consciousness. In Acts 12, verses 1 through 5, we see an example of praying without ceasing, representing continual prayer. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, 
he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. When something is important enough, you'll keep at it. When something's important enough, you'll keep it up. Hello now. I'm going to tell you, I was driving in my car, my little nephew, my brother's oldest son, had attempted suicide. And he was in a hospital out in Tyler, and I understood he was on life support, and uh, it didn't look real good, and, and we didn't have a whole lot of good word. And Tommy can tell you, we drove out to Tyler. You know, one of the biggest things I hear people say, well, I can't pray for very long, because I, I, I lose things to say. I don't know what to say. I can only talk for so long. I'm going to tell you something, honey. When it gets important enough, you'd be amazed how words will keep coming out of your mouth two-hour-plus drive to Tyler, and I mean to tell you, I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. Tommy and I didn't say two words to each other that trip. I'm not kidding. Because I prayed, and I prayed. I, I didn't have time to be talking to him. I needed to talk to the one who could do something about what was needing to be done. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I'm going to tell you, you don't want to ride in the car with me when, when there's something needing to be prayed about, because it's going to be quiet, honey. You and I aren't going to have much to say to one another. I'm going to be talking to King Jesus. And I prayed, and I prayed, all of a sudden the Holy Ghost put a song in my soul, and I began to sing this song about peace. Peace. And finally I looked over at Tommy, I said, all is well. God has spoken. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad when God speaks? You see, one of the things about keeping that prayer line open, Martin, is not only can you talk to the Lord, but he can talk back. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there are times that God will tell you, you prayed enough, hold your peace. I've taken care of it. I'm going to tell you, God won't let you waste your breath. I'm not kidding. God won't let you waste your breath. If you have touched him and he has moved on behalf of that need, he'll let you know so you can go ahead and quit praying. And then when you quit praying, guess what you do? You start thanking. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You start rejoicing. If you're me, you get shouting a little bit. You get happy in the car a little bit. I've pulled my car over on the side of the road. Not since I've been with Tommy. I've lost my joy since then. But I, there have been times... <laughs> I'm picking on him. I'm only playing. There have been times I've pulled my car over at least on the side of the road because I was feeling the Holy Ghost got out of my car, went over on the inside. I don't want to be on the side where the traffic is and done a check and just danced. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody will think you're crazy. I don't care. I don't care. Go down to Cedar Springs see how many idiots you got running around on Saturday night, drunk as a skunk, acting the fool. If they can act stupid because they got too much alcohol in their veins, I can act crazy because I got too much of the Holy Ghost in mine. Hallelujah. When God speaks back to us and lets us know that our prayer has been heard and all is well, well, now it's time to start rejoicing. Now it's time to start praising and thanking. Pray without ceasing. Keep it up. Romans 1, 9, and 10 gives us an example of praying consistently. How do we pray without ceasing? We pray continually. When something needs to be prayed for till you can't stop until God speaks, then you keep praying. That's praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing is praying consistently. Paul writes in Romans, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. 
in the gospel of his son. That without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Making request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. So Paul says that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. I pray consistently. There are people I pray for, including everybody in this room, every time I pray. Not sometimes, not a lot of times, every time. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, I pray without ceasing. When I say I pray without ceasing for you, that doesn't mean I pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week for you, but it means every time I pray, you're on my prayer list. Hello now. Hallelujah. Pray repeatedly, 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 4. I thank God, Paul writes, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. See, I pray for you repeatedly, over and over again. I'm going to tell you, they, 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 nobody ever said anywhere that, too much, that there's any such thing as too much prayer. You prayed for me too much. You know what? Don't pray for me quite as much. I'd appreciate it if you'd quit praying for me because I think you pray for me too much. No, no, no. Pray continually. Pray consistently. Pray repeatedly. Luke 18, 1 through 7. Pray persistently. This is how you keep it up. See, when you're doing something good, when you're doing something right, people will encourage you to keep doing it by saying, keep it up. Hello now. We got a couple managers back here in the restaurant game. And I'm sure they go to some of the restaurants that they oversee, and they've got a manager there doing a good job, and things are going the way they ought to be going, and everything looks good. Of course, that doesn't happen a whole lot, but every once in a while you fall upon it. And I'm sure they look at that manager and say, you know what, keep it up. Keep it up, right? That's how you encourage people. Keep doing what you're doing. Well, I'm here to tell you, Paul said, pray without ceasing. Keep it up. Live that lifestyle of prayer. Pray continually. Pray consistently. Pray repeatedly. Pray persistently. Luke 18, 1 through 7. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray. Meaning what? To pray without ceasing. And not to faint saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her lest by her continual or persistent coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Be persistent. Pray without ceasing. You got something in your life that's troubling you and you really need God to act on it? <coughs> Don't give up. Don't give up. I'm, I'm going to fill you in on a little secret, okay? There are times when God does not come when we want Him to. But He'll be there just in time. Did you hear what I told you now? There are times that God don't show up you got that job, you know, you're waiting on the job, and oh Lord, you're about ready to have a nervous breakdown, and oh my heavens, you're starting to slam the cabinet doors and put the toilet seat down kind of harsh because you're getting frustrated and aggravated, and everything you do is getting on because you're really getting wound up. 
Say, Lord, where are you? Lord, where are you? Lord, hello, Lord, are you listening, Lord? And he says, I'll be there just in time. See, he got there when Lazarus was dead. He didn't get there when Lazarus was sick. But I got news for you. He was still able to do what needed to be done, whether Lazarus was sick or Lazarus was dead. I got news for you, children. You serve a mighty big God. He can take care of you. Don't worry about the timing. The timing. Because whatever time he gets there, it's going to be the right time. Hallelujah. He doesn't always get there when you want him to, but he'll be there right on time. Oh, my goodness. You know, my Bible tells me that the parents of John the Baptist had been praying for a child and praying for a child, and they had no children. And then all of a sudden, they're old. And they're beyond childbearing years. And guess what happened? Some crazy angel showed up on their door and said, Guess what? You're going to have a baby. <laughs> what? I can just see John's parents now. The angel said, God heard your prayer. And John's father said, Prayer, you see? I prayed that prayer 40 years ago. I'm not hardly able to function these days without my bad breath. They done quit praying that prayer. Yet God heard the prayer. The problem is God had timing in mind. And it was about God's timing. Guess what? He not only gave them a baby, but he gave them a miracle baby. Hallelujah. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, don't worry about what God's doing. Sometimes God trying to hold you off a while because he's exercising. Listen to me now. He's exercising your faith muscle. I love to teach on this. He's exercising your faith muscle. If you don't have to deal with resistance, you ain't never going to grow in your faith. You go to the gym and you push air up. You just sit there on that bench. This is how booby works out. You just sit there on that bench, you know, and you just push your arms up in the air and there's no weight. There's nothing to provide resistance. There's nothing to, to really push those muscles, push against those muscles. I got news for you. You're going to leave with the same muscle tone you came in with. Am I telling the truth? No, you need resistance. You've heard the saying, resistance training. You need resistance. You need something to push back. You need something that's going to make it hard for you to do what you're trying to do because that way you develop muscles you didn't have before. You develop strength you didn't have before. You develop endurance you didn't have before. Lord, why did you wait so long? Because I was trying to get you to grow your faith. I was trying to help your faith grow. I was trying to help you get stronger. I was trying to help you get uh, so you could endure greater hardship and greater difficulty down the road than you've ever been able to endure before. Oh, you mean, Lord, everything you did was for my own good? You mean that passage in the Bible, all things work together for good to them that love God who are the called according to his purpose? You mean that passage isn't a joke? It's for real? Yeah, it's for real. I'm helping you. I'm helping you to grow. I'm helping you to develop. I'm helping you to have faith you never had before. So pray continually when the need is there. Pray consistently. Pray repeatedly. Pray persistently. Because eventually God's going to come through. Lastly, this afternoon, yes, I said lastly, one last passage. Pray passionately. See, if you grew up like some of our good folks grew up in some of these fine high churches, you know, where you pray like this. And God has to lip read to understand what you're asking. You don't know how to pray. The word of God said in James 5.16, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be.
be healed. See, you don't confess your faults one to another so you can know everybody else's faults. You confess your faults so that your neighbors and your friends in the church can pray for you that God can heal that area of weakness in your life. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Talk to God like you mean what you're saying. God is not afraid of emotion. I got news for you, folks. I don't care what First Baptist Church tells you. God is not afraid if you holler and yell. God is not afraid if you weep and cry. God is not afraid uh, if you raise your voice. You know, God's not nervous. He's not going to be sitting on his throne. Oh, dear Lord, Martin, just scaring the death out of me, praying that away. No. Pray like you mean it. You know what? When my nephew was in the hospital, I didn't pray. I was, dear Jesus, Master, we need you. God, we need you, Lord, to step in. God, we need a miracle. Jesus, we need you, God. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? I let the Lord know how I felt about the situation. Part of what God made you as a human being is emotional. Part of your makeup is your emotions. God is not afraid of your emotions. I remember one night, I'm trying to close it up. I remember one night years ago, many, many years ago, I have an aunt, <clears throat> my mother's sister. She was married to a man who had been diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. And he was in bad shape. And uh, one night I got home and my mother said they carried Harlan to the hospital tonight and the doctor said he will not survive. He won't leave the hospital alive. They had four kids, all of them under the age of eight. My aunt was only at the time, I think she was probably about 27, 28 years old. Harlan was about 30. I went in my bedroom and I shut the door in my bedroom and I began to pray and I began to cry out to God. I said, oh God, we need you, Lord, to step in. Oh God, we need a miracle for Harlan. God, that woman can't be without her husband. Those kids can't be without their daddy. And I mean, I began to cry and I got to praying in the spirit and I'm talking in tongues and I'm as loud as you please. Them walls are starting to shake a little bit. They're starting to rock a little bit. I'm really letting God know how I feel about it this. My father come home and the devils in my father normally could kill any spirit you had going. But that night I was so engrossed in prayer that I just ignored the fact I could hear my father's voice in the other room. And I just kept praying and I kept praying and I kept rocking those walls. I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. My uncle come out of the hospital that week and went home. And he lived for another two or three years after that. Oh, I'm here to tell you, God wants us to come to him passionately. Can you imagine a little girl coming into her daddy? Father, dear father, wouldst thou please taketh me to the zoo? No, go watch Sesame Street. A letter come in and say, Daddy, Daddy. Daddy, take me to the zoo. I want to go to the zoo. Can we go to the zoo? That poor father's heart melts. He can't resist his little girl. Listen, I don't have children, but I got dogs. When them boogers start looking at me with them big puppy eyes, you know, because I'm eating a piece of pizza, and they're looking at me with that big old puppy, you know. I'm telling you, ladies, I just cannot prevent myself from... I'm going to eat the cheese and, the, and all that, you know. But I'll take that crust and I'll break it in three pieces and I'll give Ginger her piece and I'll give Coco her piece and I'll give Pepper his piece because I can't resist. How much more does our Father respond to us when we come to him passionately? When we come and we express to him with emotion and with passion that which we need, even more so than that which we want. It's one thing to say, I want a dolly, I want a dolly. It's another thing for that kid to say, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Hello now. 
One of our biggest problems when it comes to prayer is most people spend more time praying about what they want than what they need. If we pray about what we needed and left the wants to God, <laughs> see, the Bible said if we'll live this thing right, God will give us the desires of our heart. Hello now, isn't that what it says? But it doesn't tell me I have to ask for them. There are times when Daddy just brings something home for you and gives it to you just because he wants to. You didn't even have to ask for it. Well, I know you like these. I remember when we were over there at Walmart. I remember when we were over there at, at uh, J.C. Penney and you admired this. So I got it for you. Right? You didn't ask him to buy it for you. All you did was show that you liked it. But you're a good kid. You do good. You get good grades. You behave well. You never embarrass mom and dad in public. You know, I, that's how us kids were. We didn't dare. <laughs> Back in the day, <clears throat> moms and dads used to carry belts, if you know what I'm talking about, and in their purse. Not dad. He didn't carry a purse. <laughs> we behaved in public. My mother used to get all kinds of compliments on us. Man, you got the best behaved kids. And I'd look at him and smile and think to myself, you bet we are. <laughs> Because, honey, if we wasn't. <laughs> but do you know what I'm talking about? You got a good kid who behaves well, gets good grades, acts right. You don't mind giving them things they want every once in a while. Am I telling the truth? God's the same way. You don't have to ask God for the things you want. Leave the things you want off of your prayer list and pray about the things you need. Because God has promised that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Got news for you. He didn't promise you wants. He promised your needs. If we'll focus on praying for the wants, we'll find out our prayers get answered a whole lot more. And we won't be so disappointed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. My mother has often said, when she was a kid, my grandparents, it wasn't that really that they were poor so much as you got ten kids and one working parent. And Grandpa worked in a factory and he made good money. But ten kids eat a lot of food. So they were working poor, you know. They, they didn't have a whole lot of extra. And my mother has said that when she was growing up, she said, I learned to decipher between a, a need and a want real quick. She said, we'd go to the store and I'd see that dolly that I really liked, you know, and, and I'd pick it up and I'd look at it and I'd daydream about owning it. She said, and I knew my parents, I knew if I went and asked them if they could buy it for me, I knew they didn't have the money. I knew they couldn't afford it, and they would have to disappoint me and say no. She said, so I learned to ask myself a question. Am I going to drop dead on the floor if I don't get this doll? Do I really, really, really need this doll? No. Yeah. And mom said, I'd put it back on the shelf and I'd go on and I didn't feel any worse for wear. I didn't moan and groan that I didn't get the doll. I said, no, because I thought about it for a minute and I really didn't need it. It was just something I would like to have. Do you follow what I'm telling you? It wouldn't hurt a lot of us believers to take that thought into mind when we're sitting there saying, Lord, I sure would like that Cadillac over there. That sure is the car I'd like to have in my driveway. I'll tell you what, I'll take a Volkswagen if it'll get me where I'm going. When you need something to get you to work and back, honey, I'm going to tell you something. It don't matter whether it's a Cadillac or it's a Volkswagen, so long as it moves and drives. And I'm going to tell you, there have been many, many times that I've driven cars that I didn't necessarily want to drive. It wasn't necessarily my favorite. I like big cars. I don't like little cars. Tommy will tell you, I bought me one of them little Toyota, I forget what they call it. I call it a roller skate with a motor. Little two-door coupe, you know. I'd get down in that thing. And, of course, I had to use a shoehorn and a little bit of grease, you know. And I'd get in it, and I'm down, practically my rear end. I could feel the vibration from the road on my rear end. 
And Martin, that car was so good on gas, my God have mercy. You wouldn't believe the mileage I got out of that car. You know what? I wasn't crazy about it, but at that time, that thing was a godsend. I could drive it for literally a month and a half on one, one tank of gas because it literally got the most incredible gas mileage. See, I could stand there and argue with God, I need a bigger car, I need a better car, I need a different car. But God met my need, and guess what? He knew better what I needed than I knew what I needed. Sometimes the Lord knows better what we need than we do. And when he answers our prayer and we don't get what we want, but we get our need met, guess what? It's because God knows what you have need of before you even ask him. Keep it up. If you're praying without ceasing, if you're living a lifestyle of prayer, then I encourage you to keep it up. If you know how to respond to every need you come across, if you know how to keep the line open with God, not just to talk to him, but to hear back from him, keep it up. That's the way to do it. That's how he wants us to live. Pray without ceasing. Would you stand with me today? Amen.